Hey everybody, this is Steve, and we're all in this together. We continue to prepare for Great Lent with a dramatic reading for a day with a rather ominous sounding name, Judgment Sunday. It's the last day we'll eat meat until we celebrate the resurrection, as we gradually ramp up for Great Lent, the most significant fast of the year. So it's no surprise that we hear a bit about food in this Sunday's readings. The epistle reading starts with a few verses about eating, which makes perfect sense for a fasting season. But, as you can probably guess, we're talking about a lot more than food this week. We're talking about judgment. And this isn't a private judgment, something that only concerns us as individuals. No, this judgment is probably the most public and social thing that will ever happen because it reflects how we interact with each other and all of creation. We proclaim the public nature of the final judgment in one of the hymns we sing this Sunday. O oh God, when you come upon the earth in glory, the whole world will tremble. A river of fire will bring all before your judgment seat, and the books will be opened, and everything in secret will become public. That sounds fun. The final judgment will be public and social, not just because everything secret will be revealed. The judgment itself is grounded in our connection. In this Sunday's Gospel reading, Jesus offers a prophetic word on the Day of Judgment when, as we proclaim in the Creed, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. This isn't merely a parable, a fictional story used to communicate a more profound point. No, this is more like the vision that Old Testament prophets sometimes had, a glimpse into a reality to which we don't always have access. It's a look at what will happen when this life passes away and we stand face to face with the Lord. When that happens, Jesus tells us that he'll divide people into two groups, the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. He explains that where you end up depends, at least according to the reading itself, exclusively on how you treated others. The sheep fed the hungry, clothed the naked, visited the sick, welcomed the stranger, while the goats didn't do any of these things. As we dig deeper, we realize that salvation and judgment aren't merely about rules and commandments. It's not merely that the sheep followed a rule and that the goats broke a rule. Because when the sheep fed the hungry and welcomed the stranger, something far deeper was going on beneath the surface. Something of which the sheep themselves weren't even aware. As the Lord tells us, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Jesus surprises the sheep, telling them that all of their acts of love and caring were done for him. And he surprises the goats, telling them that all of their acts of indifference and callousness were committed against him. To feed a hungry person is to feed Jesus. To ignore a person alone in prison is to ignore Jesus. The Lord is doing something shocking here. He's identifying, not with the ones who care for the poor, but with the poor themselves. Not with the ones who visit the sick, but with the sick themselves. Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is identifying with the lowly, the humble, the marginalized, the forgotten. Of course, if anyone should identify with the kind and righteous, it's Christ, who is so good and so loving that he is beyond goodness and love. So the Lord's choice to identify himself with the lowest in society changes everything. St. Paul shows one aspect of these monumental implications in this week's epistle, where he tells the Corinthians to avoid doing something that may cause others to stumble. He frames this conversation around food, which is why we read this passage in the lead up to Great Lent. But even though we're about to get super concerned with dietary choices, it's not for our own sake. The actual lesson is about caring for those who might see the way we eat and stumble. One of the challenges early Christians had to deal with was how to find food they could eat. In the ancient world, there was no division between church and state. The food available in the marketplace came from sacrifices offered in pagan temples, which Christians avoided. We're not going to get too deep into idolatry right now, or why Christians avoided food sacrificed to demons. Though we might be getting to that in a future episode with our friends on the Lord of Spirits podcast. For now, let's just point out that some Christians in Corinth thought it actually wasn't a big deal to eat food sacrificed to demons. So Paul's response is to look at the problem a different way. Okay, you don't think eating this food affects you, but what about the effect 
it has on others, because some Christians might see their brothers and sisters eating food offered to idols and be confused, even scandalized, and maybe even led back to the demons that most of the city worshipped. Paul is telling the Corinthians that even if they're right, which they're not, even if eating food sacrificed to idols won't hurt them, they should still avoid it because of the way it can hurt others. Because right and wrong is about more than what's right or wrong for you. That's why Paul writes, Therefore, if food is a cause of my brother's falling, I will never eat meat, lest I cause my brother to fall. And this controversy in Corinth leads us back to the bigger picture. That Judgment Day is not about whether we did what was right or wrong, acceptable or unacceptable in some internal sense. Judgment Day is about the way we treat others. Paul knew this, so he taught the Corinthians that their way of life shouldn't be guided by some abstract sense of what is right and wrong for them, but by their love for each other. And this is a teaching that applies no less to us today, whether we're talking about what we eat or how we act in the world as Christians. If someone sees us eating a hamburger on a fasting day, for example, they might grow angry or disappointed. They might fall into negative thoughts and think poorly about us or the church or maybe even God himself. And this is terrible because Christ didn't come to be a stumbling block for the weak. He came to free them. He didn't come to ignore the sick and prisoned. He came to visit them. He didn't come to destroy the humble and meek and lowly. He came to give them life. And he did this by fully identifying with them, by standing alongside them and embracing their suffering as his own. Saint Silouan the Athenite, an incredible 20th century saint, once said that my brother is my life. And in this week's Gospel and Epistle readings, we see exactly this, that our ability to receive eternal life is fundamentally rooted in the way we treat our fellow human beings, especially those whom the world considers the least of these. That God passes judgment on us when we cause others to stumble, when we add to the pain and isolation and death that our brothers and sisters are already experiencing. Because we aren't just ignoring the poor or the sick or those who might be scandalized by our self-centered ways. We're ignoring Jesus which we may not realize. And those who avoid this judgment, those who raise up rather than tear down their brothers and sisters, have no idea what they're doing either. When they feed the hungry or visit prisoners, they think that they're simply helping out other people. They don't know that they're doing this kindness for Christ himself. This is something we've seen again and again in the last few episodes, in the Pharisee, in the older brother, that what people thought they knew wasn't quite right, that there was more to the story that they were missing. We may think that salvation is simply between us and God, but we're actually more connected than we think. We may think that our actions don't matter, but they do. Our conduct in the world, the way we treat others, is how we serve, or fail to serve, Christ himself. And one of the consequences of that connection, as we see in this Gospel reading, is that our normal ideas of philanthropy and charity get turned upside down. We tend to believe that we are the ones who are serving, that we are the ones who are helping, that we are the ones who are saving our brothers and sisters in need, that we are the good guys, the saviors, which, if you think about it, is probably how the Pharisee from episode 165 would think about his philanthropy. But in this week's Gospel reading, Jesus, the savior of humankind, isn't identifying with the ones who offer help. He identifies with the poor, who receive it. And I don't know about you, but I can't think of a time that I ever rescued Jesus. Because I don't save Jesus. He's the one who saves me. And when I recognize him in the face of the oppressed, in the face of the afflicted, in the face of the needy, then, according to this gospel reading, I should actually see myself as the one who desperately needs to be saved through my care for my brothers and sisters in need. They save me not vice versa. And this is a mystery that should cause us deep and never-ending reflection and awe and gratitude. We may think that we have right and wrong figured out, but guiding our lives based on our own rightness can lead us to do something very wrong. To ignore our brothers and sisters. To scandalize and hurt them. To lead them into an unholy life. We once again become consumed by our own holiness our own righteousness, our own sense of what is right and good, 
a trap that we saw the Pharisee fall into just a couple of weeks ago. St. Paul captures this idea perfectly in this Sunday's epistle when he warns, And so, by your knowledge, this weak man is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. We should pay attention to this warning because when we cause others to fall into sin, lack of faith, and unrighteousness, it's actually we who fall the most. The only cure for this is to step out of our self-preoccupation and even self-obsession and instead make others the primary focus of our lives. Because the readings for Judgment Sunday warn us that we will be judged by the orientation of our hearts. An orientation that we need to shift away from the self and out towards God and neighbor, towards Christ who is in our midst in the poor and the oppressed. We need this reminder here, on the doorstep of Great Lent, as we prepare for 40 days of struggle and work. 40 days of ascetic labor that will grind at our hearts, chip away at the sin and selfishness and spiritual blindness that builds up within us. 40 days of repentance and grace and fervently reaching out to the Lord. 40 days of pushing myself to realize that no one needs God's grace and mercy more than I need it. The practices and struggle of Great Lent are part of the ascetic battle we fight every day of the year. The struggle to develop the kind of heart that will be drawn to the Lord even when times are tough, even when those around us are in sin, and especially when those around us need love and care. This is the struggle to develop a heart that will seek out the Lord in the humble and meek, a heart that will serve the Lord even when we can't see him, even when we're not sure that he's there. A heart that would never cause anyone to stumble, but seeks only the salvation of all. So let's be the bee and live our lives by caring for others. Be the bee and live orthodoxy. Remember to like and subscribe and share. I'll see you all next week. The church gives us concrete practices to help open our hearts to God and neighbor. And those practices are at the heart of effective Christian ministry. Great Lent is the perfect time to begin this course and learn how you can lead yourself and others to Christ. Click the link on the screen to learn more or go directly to effectivechristianministry.org.